Morning all. Barnet were playing Watford's second team last night at home at Barnet. I was playing Mike Boyce, who's actually the first team captain. He explained actually the tie break situation just in case Watford won um, tie on match points with Barnet won. It will go to game points, I think, as a secondary tiebreaker, uh, which I think we're one game point ahead. It's a narrow margin at the moment if it went to game points. And the third uh, selection criteria, if it was tied on game points, apparently it's the individual matches, and we've, we've beaten Watford won uh, twice. So I don't know. We've only got one match to go after this one. Um, so I think uh, we've got to try and get as many po um, sort of game points as, pos as possible, as well as try and win the last match, obviously. But um, last night was victory for the team. We had two wins, and this is one of the three draws. Um, so I was playing Black uh, against Mike, and he played um, E4. And... Um, I thought uh, well, I, I I I just just thought he I had this idea that uh, he would have prepared, prepared against my French defence because obviously I, I've played uh, their team um, twice already uh, no three times and I've been playing the French defence in um, in one or two of those um, so I didn't really want to go into prepared line like of course I could have gone into the French and just just deviated maybe early on. But um, I think I was a little bit inspired by the uh, David Bronstein win to try and get the um, the double pawns, uh, you know, like in, in in the last video. So actually, I played uh, c6. But unfortunately uh, for me, and this is a very popular move on chess games com, and it's probably it probably needs quite a bit of work actually if you're going to play the Karakhan to face this next move. Um, it ruins that whole idea of you know the knight f6 and, and double pawns idea because white just plays c4 here and um, it's doing very well statistically now I didn't really want a sharp encounter as black I was actually I don't know I think I was quite content um, with, with a draw and I didn't really want to have this dangerous position which I didn't really know um, all the super sharp theory uh, just in case he knew it. So I thought, okay, I've got to get some sort of trump card out of the opening. And I thought a general dark square strategy uh, would be good. And I've beaten, actually, Chernev in a, in a five-minute game a few, a few years ago with this, this idea against C4. Just to play D6, try and transpose it into like a modern defence, maybe, you know, finish out the bishop, maybe, or just an old Indian, keep the bishop on E7. So finch is also possible... But I went for the old Indian setup, so my play is going to be on the dark squares in White's position. So d4 e5. So I've avoided um, a sharp contest here, and uh, I, I'm just playing um, just to develop the pieces, and maybe later, you know, maybe there's going to be a knight maneuver later to f4. This this h3 gives me an idea that maybe f4 is slightly more vulnerable. In fact, there's another uh, issue of it later, which which I've just checked with Ribka the game. It's amazing the G3 square could have provided a source of uh, maybe a tiny advantage at some point in this game as well. So that H3, it's not only F4, it's it's G3, uh, you know, potentially this diagonal, this square, this diagonal. Th these are all interesting implications of H3 structurally. Uh, but my main uh, dark square area concern is like these squares. Okay, so I play, um, after bishop e2, we both castle, and now I play a6, and now a bit of cat and mouse on the dark squares. Uh, am I going to play b5? Maybe he's a bit concerned about that. He plays a4, and now I play a cheeky move, sealing the b4 square. So a5, so b4 is kind of sealed. I really want white to play d takes. I don't want to play that, because then knight takes, and then f4, and then this pawn's like mobile, potentially and I'm probably getting smashed in the center. I didn't like the idea of giving mobility. I wanted to stab, keep this foothold pawn on e5 here and encourage d takes, because then also, you know, the diagonal, as well as c5 and d4, are going to be a bit weaker if I can encourage d takes e5 from white. But it never happened, actually. He played very solidly now. Okay, maybe he was a bit um, annoyed by this b4, uh, this cheeky idea. He played actually bishop e3, and then we have uh, an interesting uh, concept that he wants to leave himself with the good bishop in terms of the pawn chain if d5 is, is ever going to be played without this bishop sort of blocked in by its own pawns. 
And so this next idea isn't bad, it was unexpected, I didn't see it happening. It's one of the technical benefits of H3, giving a pigeonhole to the knight now, which he actually uses. So he's aiming for this uh, structural harmony, harmony between uh, his remaining bishop on E3 and a pawn structure, which will be D5, uh, E4 and C4. So he wants to really get rid of this bishop. On the other hand, I thought my game was going to be a bit freed by this. So I played rook e8 anyway, and then we see knight g4. So um, trying to put encourage uh, maybe him, ideally in the dream world, to play f4, f5, and then I just take on d4. I would take on d4, knight c5, backward pawn to play against, e5 to play against. That's never going to happen. He plays very, very solidly now. After bishop f8, he just plays queen c2. Um, so here I, I don't really know how to proceed except perhaps b6 but um, I thought okay let's go for the ex these exchanges uh, so we've freed the position up a little bit and now he plays d5 and look at the harmony now between his bishop and the pawn structure it's pretty good it's harmonious it's, it's good that the bishops on, on different color so um, my bishop's a bit hemmed in. This is potentially a weakness. B5 is potentially a weakness, especially after my next move, uh, which was the source of a, a lively discussion in post-mortem, actually. This CD5, maybe I'm, I'm giving White uh, some major trump cards here in exchange for just the short-term dynamism of the C file, so it's a bit risky. Although this looks active, if, if White can seize possession of B5, soon he's going to have a better position so I was a bit wary here um, f3 supporting e4 but I had this idea of queen b4 the, f the thing is queen b4's you know it is it is a bit risky there's if he moves the queen and um, it wasn't really doing anything I, I don't think the, the, qu the queen b4 idea um, so I had this other idea I've got to try and get these bishops off try and get these dark squares going again um, so I played actually knight d7 uh, with a couple of points that maybe bishop here like this but also knight c5 might be useful as well. Uh, the other plan with the knight I wasn't so convinced by knight h5 to get onto f4 uh, you know maybe if you know he took I could play g6 and bishop g7 use the knight. that's another plan uh, but I thought this this maybe is better to try and get rid of um, to try and exchange off these dark square bishops. So rook fd1 and now bishop e7 um, also there's an idea maybe you know h6 bishop g5 and, and there's pressure on c c1 uh, if he doesn't exchange uh, so queen d3 um, so yeah b5 is getting under lines now as a potential uh, losing weakness actually um, so rook c4 okay but I've got some play at the moment on the c file which probably keeps it in balance just about so h6 um, now this next move, I, I want to be able to play this without knight b5 actually attacking d6. So I want, I want to get my king involved, king f8, to be able to play king e7 if needed. So king c2, now I tr offer the exchange like this. Uh, but apparently here, there's a cunning uh, Ribka idea. I'm going to st stick Ribka on here to do with that h3 move. I don't really know how convincing this advantage is. It's minus... 0.15. I wonder if you can spot this move to do with h3. If I give you 10 seconds, it's just a positional move, a positional idea. So 10 seconds here. Okay, bishop h4. I didn't really give this much consideration, but let's run through a variation of Ribka. Actually, it's putting the bishop back on d8 now. I thought it was going to be bishop g3 to f4. So I'm not really convinced about this. I mean, I played bishop d8 anyway later. So tur I'm turning off the engine. <laughs> I thought it was going to be bishop g3 f4. Forget about that. Forget about that. Okay. So what I did play in, in the game was uh, after bishop g5. Okay, maybe I wasted time. I could have done this immediately then. Bishop d8. So now if I play rook b4. Ah, here. Sorry. This, this is a technical, um, some technical possibilities about the rook getting trapped. If I played rook b4, then I I thought, you know, this this king b2 would be threatening to trap the rook. And here, um, well, actually, this this did happen. Pardon me. Sorry. P pardon me. This did happen. Um, th I did go in for this after b3. Uh, the other choice here doesn't look too pleasant, rook c7. 
because uh, uh, potential king b2 and knight b5. But um, here actually, king b2, this, this might be okay. This position might be slightly better for, for black, especially with bishop g5s now. It's quite delicate, the balance actually, the, the dynamic balance of b5 versus the dark squares. Uh, but in the game continuation, I, I, I played rook b4, knowing that you know the rook's a bit vulnerable to king b2 and knight a2. So bearing that in mind, but I've got this bishop b6 now to try and get off these these dark square bishops. So the whole game's been about the dark squares from from my point of view. But remember, it's the Hearts League, and at move, we're playing the long game, unfortunately, not to finish. Uh, so that means adjudication or adjournments at, at move 36. So unless I've got a really big advantage, there's no real point sort of playing on because you know we're both going to look with engines etc and play much stronger after if if it had to be adjudicated to another day. That's an unfortunate thing about this league. It's a mix between over the board chess and correspondence chess, uh, and I really haven't got anything to sort of uh, write home about here. I've got my my dark square blockade, which is a logical outcome of of how the opening was played. Uh, now I guard my d6 again to say knight d6 as I can play king takes d6 protecting c5 um, and now I kind of make sure that c5 is secure against um, you know this maneuver which would be threatening all sorts of things so I play rook a6 to be able to play b6 so knight a3 b6 and I've got my kind of fortress and I've, I've offered the draw once or twice actually in this game already and finally, um, you know, I'm, I'm sealing a move now at about 10.30. Time to seal the move, put the move into a, an envelope, etc. It all starts to get a bit official. Uh, and um, so I, I did seal a move. I, the move I sealed is king c7. I sealed king c7 so I can uh, keep the king on these two so I can move the rook maybe like this. Now, if it had been an over-the-board game, uh, this plan would seem to justify the knight on c5 having pressure on e4 and the pawn structure undermining undermining white's pawn structure at the the most convenient exploitable base of the chain which i think is e4 so this this would be my intention if this game carried on from white's point of view he's got potentially active pieces and a potential break of f4 if only e4 wasn't terribly weak um let's just follow a ribka line here so f4 here, in fact it seems ef might give white an advantage here according to Ripper, but I'm not sure I, I believe that. Is this really true, giving up the e5 square? I think black can't be any worse here. Anyway, not nor can white really. This, this is in balance, this kind of position will be kind of in balance. And this is, is there a minority attack after h4? Whoa, slight advantage to white? No, it's gone, gone to 0 0.01 now. g5 check. Hmm, it's it's interesting, um, and I've got an opportunity here now. Apparently, to play b5 and rook b8, if if this occurred. So I think there's potential counterplay um, chances now. A4. So yeah, this, this should be in balance this game. Um, so there's no point like carrying it on just to chase half a point and, and, and risk. I don't know, even worse. I know losing potentially. So by agreeing a draw, we we won the match. Uh, we had two wins, three draws, three and a half, one and a half. So I just secured my dark square fortress, uh, basically with with the sealed move, king c7. Now I requested, so I've got two choices after sealing the move, to request either to play on or to request adjudication. Now I requested adjudication. Now if he wanted to play on, he'd have to come back to Barnet. A bit of uh, convenience for me. Uh, just to get to Barnet and inconvenience for him. So he actually elected for adjudication as well because the other game with Alex actually was winning, uh, the opponent resigned. So there was no point trying to salvage the match, trying to, to beat me from this position. So he just accepted the draw. So that was last night. We've got one match to go in the Hearts League. Um, so basically, uh, the trump cards out of the opening. I just wanted to play on the dark squares. Unfortunately, you know, he was never tempted with moves like D takes, or even worse later, F4, F5, allowing me to play E takes. So structurally, he was always fairly solid. 
And the clever bit, I think, of White's play was this knight h2 and bishop g4 getting rid of this potentially bad bishop within its own um, white square pawns uh, complex. So, so I think there was some nice play from 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 White here to maintain um, a harmonious pawn structure and and pieces here. And White has this potential advantage now. Of, of b5 in this continuation after d5 so white was I think slightly better here even though I seem to have visually um, some play it's kind of suppressed a bit um, so I have got the plan to try and exchange off the dark square bishops and try and weaken uh, white's dark squares a little bit more but it's kind of offset um, by, by white's sort of trumps the b5 um, square for example um, so, so basically, uh, I think a draw was a, f a fair result here. After the dark squares uh, were a bit weakened, a bit further, but there's no, there's nothing really concrete. And White's grip on b5 uh, secures him at least a draw. Um, so he's got a good position. I'm just barricading uh, the position, cementing the knight on c5 against you know tactical ideas, um, and then making sure the king can can release the rook. With this silver move, King C7, which never saw the light of day, we just we draw. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope there's something instructive in there. Probably, if if you want to play this line for a win, it's good to know the theory of C4, to know some systems to try and get something out of the opening. There's there's some sharp theory in this. Maybe I should have played D5. That's the critical test. Um, but it's it's different from you know the Bronstein David Bronstein game. Obviously, I wanted to simulate the Larson the Bronstein Larson variation. Uh, to accept double pawns and go for a, di a truly dynamic game, but the possibility was never given to me <laughs> because of c4. Unfortunately, on move two, bit of a shame. Um, comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.